Our Father, we thank you now for this day. Just be with us now as we learn our lesson and are being taught it. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, we are going to continue our study in the book of Hosea. Um, the connecting chapters from last week was uh, to gain context for what we're going into today. We're going into chapter 10 today. For those that have books, we're on uh, page 82 in your book. If you do not have a book, we have scriptures, um, which is Hosea 10, 5 through 15. And the title of our lesson today is The Sin Harvested. We all know when you sow sin, there has to be a harvesting. And God chooses when that time is and what the harvest will be. So there's a caption in our books that says, God's judgment will be experienced by those who reject him. And our connecting chapters 8 and 9 just simply tells us there's three messages from chapter 4 to chapter 14. And the first message is we, we are sinful and God is holy. That was the message from Hosea to the people of Israel. We are sinful, and God is holy. And then in chapter 10, there's another message. Judgment is sure, and, and God is just. Judgment is sure, and God is, is just. And the third message as we go to the end of the book is you are rebellious people, but I still love you. That's God's message to, to the nation of Israel. When you're not speaking, will you please turn off your mics because we get feedback in the background. So if you're not speaking, please turn off your microphone. Uh, if we look on page 82, there's always a little caption there. And we try not to spend a lot of time in this area, but this morning we'll do a little bit more. It's at the bottom, there are the last two sentences. Well, I think we probably should read the whole thing because it pertains to each and every one of us. As it says, breakups are painful. They rarely happen suddenly or for one single act, but usually are an accumulation of missteps, breaches of trust. As each misstep carries a consequence that eventually adds up. Couples cannot neglect their relationship and hope everything will turn out good. As Israel disregarded the consequences for neglecting their relationship with God, and the results was disastrous. Their reject of God did not happen overnight. But each step away from God led them closer to break up. And we know that the break up is the Assyrians comes and take them over and everything else is history after that. <clears throat> but this was God's uh, loving discipline for the sin that was told over time. And this little little caption here that I just read tells us that it's rarely one incident that creates a breakup in a relationship. It's normally a series over time 
that creates the issue in the long run. Uh, I was in banking for 25 years, and one little thing that I learned was I dealt with a lot of uh, deposits and withdrawals. And that's kind of what life is. Every day you're making uh, positive deposits into a relationship. But if you're not doing that, or if you're just ignoring the, the relationship altogether, that's a negative response also. You need to be making deposits every day and not withdrawals into that relationship. Short-term or long-term relationships, it doesn't make any difference how long it is. But there must be positive deposits into that relationship. Now, there's a question at the bottom here. Why is ignoring a relationship just as toxic as deliberately, deliberately sabotaging a relationship? Uh, the one thing that I thought of immediately is there has to be ongoing communication. And I don't see anything in this question concerning communication. Uh, that is vital. For a short-term or long-term relationship, there has to be positive communication. That's the question. Does anybody want to uh, chime in on that particular question? Yeah, Freddie. Okay, go ahead. Ignoring a relationship is just as toxic as deliberately sabotaging a relationship because it produces the same results. With ignoring, the effect is or may be slow and drawn out, whereas deliberate sabotage usually gets immediate results. Yeah, that, that's very, very true. Uh, I'd like to add something to that. Sure, go right ahead. Um, you know, I put uh, – they both stem from uh, disrespect and a lack of appreciation or reverence. You know, so, you know, I mean, they sort of, uh, like, as, as Brother Freddie said, they result in the same thing. When you're not, you know, respecting the relationship um, and, and you don't appreciate, you know, you disregard the relationship. So you don't uh, hold it in high esteem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amen. Someone else? Uh, Yes, um, this is great. I would say that um, ignoring the relationship uh, just allows more negatives to build up in the situation. And over a long period of time, you got a whole book full of negatives there. And when it blows, it's probably more disastrous than deliberately blowing it up. Amen. Because if you're not making positive deposits, then What's the other thing? It's not but two things here. You're making withdrawals if you're not putting anything in the relationship. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's going to be a stack of withdrawals, like you say, and in the end, uh, you're going to have a, a relationship that is toxic and it's going to lead to separation. Uh, I think, too, the one thing that we never think about when we're making these choices with the relationship is sin always multiplies. One person does something negative and another person seeking revenge, if they're not on God's side, then they seek revenge and that's another negative and then the other person does the same and, and so on and so on. And before you know it, you're somewhere where you never intended to be. And uh, I agree with everything that's been said because all of it is true. But I think 
the one thing right in the center of this, we have to start with uh, the word. We have to start vertically first. Which means our hearts have to be right. And to, to tell you the truth, it doesn't take two people to start this thing to roll it. If one person just repent and go back to the other party and start a conversation, a lot of times I find it's when people don't talk to each other, which you find the nation here had not spoken to God. They were serving Baal. They would go down to Judah and they would would um, would go down there and worship and then they would come back and serve Baal. And God could see that that was a divided mind and no one can serve two masters. So they were already in a bad place and this was not going to turn out well. But that but that was good. Thank you so much for those points. Um, at the bottom of page 83, it tells us to read uh, 10, through, uh, 10, 5 through 15. And uh, there's another question here. It says, look for clues that point to self-reliance. How does self-reliance instead of trust in God lead to disaster for the people of God? So we're going to come back to that, but we're going to read 5 through uh, 8 here at the top of page 84 for those that have books. It says, explore the text, false religion. So we just talked about that, false religion. Uh, it's Hosea 10, 5 through 8. The residents of Samaria will have anxiety over the calf of Belhaven. Indeed, it's idolatrous priests rejoiced over it. The people will mourn over it, over its glory, because it will certainly go into exile. The calf itself will be taken to Assyria as an offering to the great king. Ephraim will experience shame. Israel will be shamed for his counsel. Samaria's king will disappear like foam on the surface of the water. The high places of Aben, the sin of Israel, will be destroyed. Thorns and thistles will grow over the altars. They will say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. See here that um, there's a situation here mentally. He's getting them emotionally and mentally ready for this takeover, if that's possible. I don't know whether that's possible to be ready for this type of thing, but this prophet that God sent was giving them what would happen. Uh, now, if, if we go back to our question, uh, look for clues that point to self-reliance. How does self-reliance instead of trust in God lead to this asker for people of God. I think that question should be left until we read uh, further. But what we just read shows you that sin always produces shame. 
when it's full grown, it produces death. And that's the separation of relationships, the death part. But it's always shame involved with sin. If we go over to page 85, before, before we leave the reading, did anyone want to say anything on these particular scriptures? Well, you know, they, they asked us to point out, um, I did answer the question, but you said told us to hold off. But I will say on with this one, you know, the, the anxiety, you know, we live in an age of anxiety, right. idolatrous, uh, yes. idol- uh, idolatry. Uh, they start. There was mourning. Uh, the right. one king, Samaria's king, disappeared. You know, uh, right. uh, destruction. Uh, says, uh, yep. And then at the end, cover us. That's that, right. Fall on us. So that was the shame, kind of like Adam. What right. happened to Adam and the and Eve in the Garden of Eden? So, yeah, I guess there there is a progression, maybe. You know. Yeah, there. It's always a natural. But I'll, I'll hold off on my answer though. You told us to wait. So. No, no, no. That hey, that was good. That's why I asked people to chime yeah. in because because you're thinking something that I'm not. I'm thinking something that you're not, and everybody on this virtual site is thinking something that the other person is not. That's why we are. You know, <laughs> right, but you know, I I put ultimately, you know, we lose our way. You know, yeah. when we uh when we don't uh, rely, how does self-reliance instead of trusting God lead to disaster and lead to disaster for the people of God? We lose our way. We lose sight of God's plan and purpose and how to fulfill it. That's right. Um, and it's John 5, 15, 5, you know, he's the vine. You know, he says, I am the vine. Mm-hmm. You're the branches. Right. You know, he that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And that's that's the way I Amen. Amen. And these these people were not bringing forth any fruit at all, and we're going to read that later. But that that was the issue. It's okay, Deacon. Deacon, you have something to say? Go ahead. Um. Uh. Uh-uh, we. Somebody. Oh, oh, you. Turn your mic on. Also, it it um, shows that continuously following this uh, false religion leads to a, a downward spiral. I mean, the longer they continue in that, the further they were getting away from God, and they're just going into self-ruination. That's all I have to say. That's right. Okay. Go ahead, David. Yes, so uh, as we continue, you know, I just want to point out the trust of uh, this lesson, you know, saying harvested. So we can see here uh, where they are deviating from what God has established. It's only God that we must worship, the, the Ten Commandments, the first law. It is very clear there. So whenever you go over there, then you are negating what God has established. And we can see... The feverishness, you can see how oh, okay. engrossed that they were in this false religion. They were really, really into it, you know. So now God is telling us that you see how sin develops. So when you go to James, you know, that it, uh, God, that it will how the progression of sin goes, then finally it leads to death, and you cannot escape God's judgment. So now God is exposing them. Is letting us know that these people are not just, you know, just worshiping this thing. They are into it. Right. You know, they're into it. So they have this anxiety of this false religion. So everything is going to fall under God's judgment. So we must understand that it has been proven that these guys were really not worshiping God, but they were engrossed in their false religion. Amen. And um, may I add? May I add to that? This is Joe. No, um, you, you started off very good with the uh, illustration of the relationship and your relationship of how you deposit 
into a relationship. And, and this whole thing about harvesting the sin and false religion falls on the people were at this time idolatrous. They had lost their hope in God. Their, they had no more patience in God. And us today, we can see this all over our world today. Everything is instant gratification. You know, we got same day, next day delivery. We don't have to wait on anything. And the people back then in Samaria, this letter, this thing is telling us they were in the, the calves of this idol, anxious over this calf that was supposed to have been this idol that they had. And it was in a place of house of I, iniquity and wickedness, you know, and then all these things. And we looked at how they get their leaders at this time, just like our leaders today, our, our religious leaders, our priests, are going down all these wrong roads, uh, approving all these laws and all these things that are abomination to God. But then we still don't have patience. We don't have hope in God still. We fall in these false religions. And then the, the bottom line of this is that it says that they're going to be carried away like the foam on the sea. And I don't know if you are. What that's saying to us today is, hey, we can trust in our military, we can trust in our 401k, we can trust in all these different things, but we should be putting our trust in God. We should have patience because the Bible tells us if we have patience with God, you know, if we're just, we live by faith in him. And we don't have to go for all, all these other things that we're putting our hope in. So we will be swept away by these things eventually if we keep building them up in our lives, you know, what we have, how, our nice houses, our nice cars, whatever we have. And this is a good lesson to us right now that we have to be patient and wait on God and stay. Remember, we have to stay the course. You know, a lot of folks, they fall away. And I looked at your uh, illustration again where you said that a, a percentage, I had a book that said a percentage of people that start college don't finish. A percentage of people that start relationships, they don't finish. Uh, a percentage of people who say they are believers in Christ, when the times get hard, they revert back to their old ways. They don't finish. So, I mean, we can depend on all these false relationships, but they eventually lead us all to separation from God because we don't deposit the right amount of time with him. So that was my little take on these verses right here, the first eight. Okay, thank you for bringing that closer to home, uh, Joe, uh, to today. Uh, I think the one thing from this we need to remember is one thing, and that is when we say no to God, we'll say that we don't trust you. We have a better way. Mm -hmm. We have a better way to do this. We don't trust your way. Anytime you do that, you're headed down the wrong road. Okay. If we go over to page uh, 85, it says false worship had so blinded them that they did not know right from wrong. Yeah. Now, I go back to what Deacon Felix just said, these people were really into it. I mean, they 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 were in all the way, lock, stock, and bell. I mean, if they was they didn't know they would leave Baal and go down to Judah and worship at the Ark of the Covenant and turn around and go right back home and burn incense to Baal. How do you do that if you know right from wrong? These people didn't know right. If they, if they, if they had to come to, uh, I guess totally oblivious to what right was at that point. So right, right beneath that, there's a question there. What do you think? What do you think? Does worshiping something other than God have on a person's life? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I think we can start by saying, you know, you remember Moses? When he brought the people together, choose life or death. Either you follow God or you follow your first idols. Amen. So, Amen. so whenever you do things that uh, against what God has established, it is futile, it is hopelessness. You know, right. I mean, and of course, it leads to death, which is the pressure of God. Right. You choose life. <laughs> Is anyone else on that question? I well, I, I just want to say, oh, go ahead. What I said uh, is that it leads to a wide gate and a broad road that leads to destruction. Uh, it turns your heart from God to the love of idols. Uh, what, in order to have a healthy and ongoing relationship, the essentials of that relationship with God, you need to hear what he says, which means you uh, absorb and accept the information about God. Then you learn, you get understanding and the meaning and implications of his word. And then... After you do those two things, you put it into action, what you have learned and what you understand. When you do those essentials, you are maturing in your relationship with God. As you do that, you become more, um, it, it becomes more of your walk in knowing um, what to do and to um have that ongoing by walking in what God says, that's how you're worshiping him. When you just rely on yourself, uh, as the question was before, first of all, in self-reliance, the word right there, self, we know that deals with ego. And ego means edging God out. That's what these people, that's what we do when we slowly do things that's against Christ uh, and we lean to our own way of understanding and doing things so that after a while we really don't even have a relationship with God. So um, by taking hold of anything that's false that does not really uh, addresses and continues the holiness of God, Jesus Christ, we have then gone to that other side. We are now uh, doing Beth Bethel Abin, which is doing, we're walking in wickedness, and we are not remaining in Christ Jesus and walking in the house of Bethel, which is the house of God. Amen. The, uh, as I just simply wrote here, uh, sin begets sin. And if you're worshiping something other than God, then the, the fruit, the fruit of whoever you're worshiping. Now, these people were following the instructions of the priests and Jesus, okay? And... Uh, we we see that these people were le were led down a primrose path with the these instructions because the priests were taking bribes the judges were taking bribes so the religion itself was a foul religion so they are following somebody so what's going to happen is whatever you act on mm -hmm. then you're going to wind up with shameful fruit yeah. or no fruit at all. Well, you might have a dried up raisin or something like that, but it's not going to be much more than that. And also, uh, I would just like to add that uh, what effect worshiping something, uh, Jeroboam, he had set this all up. We saw it in the scripture where they put this calf in the middle of the path for the people who wanted to go back to the Jerusalem to worship God, and they put this false image to block their path. So they are worshiping this false image, blocking their path to the true place of worship. Like 
were which was Basel. So one thing it blocks your path, and then the other thing I would add to it that it separates you from the true God. Right. You know, so those are the two things that I wrote that when you put your <laughs> worship something other than God. Right. It blocks your path, right. and then it also separates you. Exactly. And they became double-minded. You're right, Joe. <laughs> That's what happened. They became double-minded, and once you do that, I mean, you you don't know you're left from your right. You know? And it kept them in the high places, see? It did. <laughs> it kept them in the high places as well. You know, it blocked them out from going down, being humble to the Lord, That's going right. down the sack. And this was all put in place by the leader, the king. Amen. The exactly. king did all this with his priests and everything in these high places, worshiping all this false stuff. And the people was like, hey, they used to have a saying, when you're in Rome, do as the Romans. Right. So exactly. that's what they were doing. That's how they did it. Yeah. When this guy was king, though, they became very prosperous and very proud. Exactly. And then when they became proud, yeah. then they became self-sufficient in their eyes. That's correct. You know? So at that point, I mean, God was out of the picture at that point. Exactly. And that's why the prophet, the prophet told him that, hey, you're going to be washed away like foam on right. the water. And you, I know, I remember when we were kids, we used to, on a rainy day, we would take this little twig and we would drop it in the gutter and watch it float down the road. That's right. And that's the exact same way the, the Bible says that our riches, moths are going to take them away, they're going to rust away, they're going to go away. Whatever we put our trust in here on earth, it's all going to float away like that twig down the stream or that foam on the river, yeah, on the open waters. Correct. All right. Thank you. Thank everybody for those comments. Wow. That that was uh, good stuff. Uh, Deacon Anajapi, can you read Misplaced Trust for us if you have your book? Uh, okay. Uh, what is that name? <laughs> Page oh. 85. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there. Okay. Uh, misplaced Trust. Hosea 9 to 10. Israel, you have seen since the days of Gibeah, they have taken their stand there. Will not war against the unjust overtake them in Gibeah? I will discipline them at my discretion. Nations will be gathered against them to put them in bondage for their double iniquity. The Lord had a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Thank you so much. Okay, in in uh, these verses, it mentions Gibeah. Um, Gibeah was a, a situation. What he's talking about here is a uh, a five day war with uh, tribes against the tribe of Benjamin, due to uh, a Levite concubine that had been killed in Gibeah. And that's what he's referring to here. But he's really saying, did you not learn anything from Gibeah? Mm -hmm. Did you not learn anything from that experience? Because everybody had heard about it. It was thousands of people that got killed in five days. Starting off with 22,000 of the Israelites, and then the next day, 18,000 of the Israelites. So, thousands of people got there. So, everybody knew about this battle. That's why it's mentioned here. And when we get over to our Bible skills, we will see just how this plays a part in here. But, um, uh, If we go over to, to the Bible skills, they're on the next page, actually, and we can actually talk about these verses. Uh, it says, I will discipline them at my discretion. Now, that tells us one thing, that everything is in God's time and his will. Yep. Uh, we, we, we don't say when our discipline is coming. 
but it always comes after prolonged sin. If you sin once, you probably got grace holding you up or mercy taking care of you. But the Bible speaks of the practice of sin, and practice means over time. And that's what this is saying, that he will, will let you know when he is going to apply this discipline. And the, the last sentence says, nations will be gathered against them to put them in bondage yep. or they are double iniquity. That means the same situation that it was in Gibeah. All the rest of the tribes lined up, gathered up against Benjamin because that's where Gibeah was located. So... Uh, did anyone do the Bible skills, first of all? The Bible skills required reading uh, Judges uh, 19 mm -hmm. and 20. Uh, yeah. Brother uh, Allen, I um, started with it, mm -hmm. and I got so uh, involved in the, uh, the uh, mm -hmm. content, the story, <laughs> that it was really, uh, you know, it's just a lot that I um, found out that I didn't know about this situation. <laughs> but the only thing I'm going to mention that I came up with uh, was the fact that actually I went to um, Judges 21, 25, mm -hmm. which sums it all up, yeah. and it says, in those days there was no king in right. Israel, right. and yeah. every man did what that which was right in his own eyes. Uh, and uh, they had their own uh, standards, their own laws, any, anything goes, which happened also uh, in uh, Hosea 10, 9. So... Um, the condition that uh, was uh, uh, in, in uh, 19 and 20, as stated above in the book, uh, there were a lot of perversion going on there, a lot of abuse, uh, which was the same as in Hosea 10, uh, uh, 10 that happened. So I just compare those two, and it seems like, in each situation, in uh, Hosea and in uh, Judges, yeah. that uh, they were doing whatever was right in their sight, and the priest uh, was even worse. Amen. 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 They, the, pre the priest was actually leading them into sin because they created all these laws, and they was pointing them to stuff that was unrighteous. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it's better than where we are now. So yeah. you have to better take better take note because God's patience is going to run out. <laughs> That's right. So for me, I, I looked at it too. It was very interesting, but you know, we are going to talk about it. We will not uh, leave this place today. But uh, the only thing that I want to say about it is that you know, just like our uh, one sentence, one sentence. Uh, God's judgment. God's judgment will be experienced by blessed by duty. And uh, why? Because what we just read, we saw that um, God gathered against them to put them in bondage for their double iniquity. You know, which means, you know, uh I'm phrasing here, that Israel had sinned. That is one. Okay? But the second one is that they have taken their stand. So they are refusing to repent. Right. You know, so you can see the emphasis here on double iniquity. So right. it is one thing to sin, and it's another to refuse to repent. Right. You know, so that's important. So when God's judgment comes, God is a just God. Amen. You know? Yeah. So that is one of the things that I want to say, including from Judges to and comparing it to Brazil. Right. And th th this is uh, 
is also the the uh, these people just simply was in not an humble people at this point. They had no intentions of repenting, and he could see that. So this this had came to the point where this judgment could no longer be staved off. He had to do this. He had to do it. <laughs> he had to do it. If he's a just God, then he has to give you what you deserve because he wouldn't be just if he didn't. So this, this is preparation for that. And, uh, and Jose is, is, is pointing out to them about their misplaced trust, and he's telling them that uh, their sins engulf the whole nation and uh, that, that also challenged those who trusted in their military might, you know, and, uh, and political power and security instead of the, and they were in security in those instead of secured in the Lord. Right. And, and the people faced judgment because of their apostasy and their trust in those military things. I looked at it like, like uh, we look at it today as us as America, a great powerful nation. And then we sit there, and I think MC Hammer had a song out once talking about, you can't touch this. You know, we got the best military around. We go around passing all these legal rights to make everybody happy. Uh, we go around about, we. you can gamble. You know, it's nothing. You look at TV now, it's uh, MGM, bet, bet this, bet that. You know, you're getting involved, drink liquor. Everything on television is, is all leading us to corruption and mis place trust. All these things they're putting in front of us to make us trust in these things of the world and again, they're going to be swept away because our real trust should be in God. Amen. Yeah, yeah my, my wife always has a when I hear her say the pride of life <laughs> the pride of life comes from this type of arrogance. Uh, there's nowhere to run uh Omnipresence means omnipresent. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it means nothing else but that. Uh, question on page 87. How does trusting in political and military strength produce a false sense of security? I think you just nailed it, Joe. Yeah, I think that about said it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you just nailed it. Uh, because the military might, well, the guy that created this entire thing, well, started this thing, Jeroboam II, uh, he was a military man, and most of the wealth that they had, they had stolen from someone else, taking over other uh, countries and stuff. And all of the countries around them were afraid of them. So uh, they were kind of sitting in the catbird seat, so, so to speak. And they, they were wealthy, prosperous, and they had become an industrial uh, uh, conglomerate, as Tyre used to be when uh, King Hiram was there. And Solomon was getting a lot of stuff from King Hiram and Tyre, but Tyre was an industrial metropolis at the time. And they, they, they had to come the same thing, and they had to come proud and trust in the military, as this, this question says. So I think we've answered that question. Of course, if someone else would like to chime in, that's good. I was just simply going to uh, add to that when we trust in our human uh, strength and efforts without seeking God first. I believe Pastor has given us a message on everything that we do, we should seek God first. And the most appropriate scripture, uh, which I believe he cited in that message, was Proverbs 3, 6. And everything you do, put God first. He'll direct you and crown your efforts 
with success. When we don't do that, human effort, anything that we do out of self is going to fail. Amen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, okay. and I'd like to add that, I, I, I just wanted to add that, you know, um, political regimes and military strength can be corrupt and it can be defeated. Yep. Oh, yeah. Amen. Yeah, no Amen. question. <laughs> okay. Uh, Look at that bold text right there. It says uh, on page 87, had yep. Israel followed the Lord, how would he would have made life much simpler? There you go, right there. The crux of the matter, right? Yeah. Begin with the end in mind, right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, boy. Uh, right beneath that, what could have been? Uh... Can I get you to read that, Mrs. Allen, if you will? Yes. What could have been Hosea 10, verses 11 through 12, Ephraim is a well-trained calf that loves to thresh, but I will place a yoke on her fine neck. I will harness Ephraim. Judah will plow. Jacob will do the final plowing. Sow righteousness for yourselves and reap faithfulness love, faithful love. Break up your unplowed ground. It is time to seek the Lord until he comes and sends a righteousness on you like the rain. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you so much. We see here, I have a, uh, a very old Bible. And uh, in that Bible, it addresses this as uh, as Ephraim is a well-trained, backslidden (laughs) heifer. Because I just thought that was so appropriate for the behavior of these people. It's what he's saying right here is come back. Come back. Turn around. You know, we don't have to do this. Come back to me. There's so much compassion in that. But they have no no idea of where they are, so they're certainly not coming back. And they are not going to turn around from what they're in right now. But he is still saying that you are my people. I will never, ever leave you. He's begging them almost here. And you, you see what it says here. I will punish Ephraim. Judah will plow. Jacob will do the final plowing. Now, we can't leave Judah out of this, okay? <laughs> okay? Yeah. Because they had their own stuff going on down there, too. That was just where the Ark of the Covenant was, okay? But they were doing some of the same stuff that these people were doing. That's why every now and then you hear Judah pop up in these verses because there was some some things going on there that God wanted to to clear out, and eventually they were taken over also. So, just it took a little longer. That's all. So, does anyone have anything to say or add on these verses before we go to our key doctrine? Yeah, I, I would like to say quickly that um, we are seeing here again uh, God's long suffering and mercy. He's been extended, you know, so it takes a long time. You know, we used to ask you know, when we started, uh, why do wicked people continue to try? You know, right. and nothing happens to them, you know, all through our pain, you know, it keeps coming on, coming on. But right. God's uh, judgment will come. 
but it's not like immediate. You know, we've answered those questions here before. Why do we see things like that? And why do they get away with it? So right. we see there again, God is telling them, sow righteousness for yourself, you right. know, and reap what? Fruitful love. Fruitful. He's still telling them. Right. Then we go back again to our theme, the trust of his, uh, the God's judgment will be experienced by those who reject it. You know, so it's not that God wants to, you know, discipline or do anything, but he has right. really ample opportunity, ample right. chance, you know. I don't want to say, oh, he grew out of pain. No, it's long-suffering. Right. The time will come that he has to give the judgment. God's patience doesn't run out. You know, yeah. it doesn't run out. It's just the timing. When right. that comes, God is going to make it that. God is not weary. God is not mad. So right. it's everlasting. So we must always remember that. You know, so God is there. But when that time comes, he's just going to give it. So right. all, all through that, you know, so that's what I see from here. There's ample time for each and every yeah. Yeah, that that that's so appropriate. In uh, the um, in uh, I think it's Revelation, uh, the last chapter of Revelation. There's three times in there he says, "I come quickly, mm -hmm. I come quickly," and then the last one it says, "Behold, I come quickly." That means that he has given you ample opportunity to repent. Correct and get on his side. Amen. But when it comes, it comes quickly. You won't have time to go to the restroom. <laughs> okay. Is, is it anyone else? Okay. Let's go to our key doctrine. Can somebody look up uh, Psalm 92 12? Through 14 and 2 Peter 3 18. Eighteen one, I guess that means. No. Nah, 318. The key doctrine. The sanctification. Yep. Growth in grace should continue through the regenerate person's life yeah. and supporting scriptures are psalm 92 12 to 14 mm -hmm. and second peter 318 does anyone psalm, have psalm 92 um, verses 12 through 14 read, mm -hmm. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. Mm. Amen. Amen. Second Peter uh, three eighteen, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Mm. Okay. Sanctification is a lifetime thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Ooh, man. But he that endureth until the end, right? Yeah. Hmm. You know, uh, on this key doctrine, I always think about the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And I always think about those two words. When you're justified, that means just like you don't have any sin at all. He wiped the slate clean. But this word sanctification, this is just a little bit more, you know, in depth. This is a lifetime deal. Mm -hmm. 
for he that endureth until the end. That's a long time. So so you think about the word the wages, that's something that you earned. You earned that. Whatever it is, you earned it. Yep. And God has to give it to you because he wouldn't be just if he didn't. Mm -hmm. My goodness, if you're practicing something that's wrong and then you get to the I come quickly stage and he said, you know what? I'm not going to come quickly. I'm going to let you go with this. No, you've been practicing this for a lifetime. God can't do that because he's a just God. He has to give you what you deserve. So the point of it is the gift, on the other hand, as we're talking about here, the gift is free. Let's put free in front of that gift. A free gift. Now you can accept it or reject it. He still gave you a choice. And that choice is always ours. And you don't have to you don't have to take it right away because he's a a God of patience. Exactly. He's a just God and he's waiting. He's waiting for you to turn around, repent and come back. And he gives you so many chances to do that. Is anybody else on our key doctrine? Uh, I think this uh, is Charlene. Uh, during the week, I uh, won a class. They talked about that, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Right? They're teaching the children what it means. And in the book, uh, they just put simply that it is set apart or made holy. And uh, one of the things that the children learned was that God is holy, which means that He is perfect without sin. And is always right, you know. So right. we ask you, so what does so what does set apart mean? You know, set apart to be holy. You know. So, Miss Shannon, you can tell us a little bit what you told the students. Oh, geez, I don't even remember. Yeah. <laughs> that was on Wednesday. Especially so because remember we mentioned it, you know. So. Whether adults or children is the same word, so we try to use those words also. Yeah, they use they simplified it to set apart, but it means to be um, set aside. Um, and we wanted to emphasize to them to to be different, to be set aside, to follow God, um, which means that may be different from what they see around them, but they're set set apart to be holy and to strive right. to be holy. Right. And that's, that's important for young people because it's hard for them to be set apart or to be different. It's yeah. stressful, but they're being set apart for a bigger mission. Amen. They're to stay faithful to God no matter what. Yeah. We had, we had a pastor when I was uh, a teenager. You go to see him and he say, uh, okay, uh, what's on your partially sanctified mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, then I always, I always thought that was funny because in essence he was right. So sanctification is a lifetime deal. <laughs> yeah, but sanctification don't come overnight. So, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, Charlene, would, would you read Sowing Unrighteousness? Please, on page 88. I hope I didn't catch you off. No, no, I'm right off there. Hosea 10, 13 through 15. Yes. You have plowed wickedness and reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you have trusted in your own way and in your large number of soldiers. The royal battle will rise against your people and all your fortifications will be demolished in a day of war. Like Shalman's destruction of Beth Arbel, mothers will be dashed to pieces along with their children. So it will be done to you, Bethel, because of your extreme evil. At dawn, the king of Israel will be totally destroyed. Mm. Okay. Amen. 
And may God add a blessing to the reading of his mighty word. Uh, we see everything that we've discussed this morning is kind of summed up right here. <laughs> this, this says in one day, okay, in one day all of this is going to happen. I, I, I thought about uh, when God sent out one angel to kill 185,000 Assyrians. God is uh, very, very powerful. And the things that happen, he orchestrates these things. They're orchestrated under his watch, so to speak. However, he doesn't operate in space and time, but still we do. So, but what we have here is exactly what we've talked about here. When you, when you, you plow wickedness, then you reap injustice. You can't plow wickedness and reap righteousness. The, just, that's an oxymoron. You know, you just can't do that. Whatever you sow, that's what you reap. And that's what is killing us here. But did did someone have something to say? Okay, uh, we're going to our last question here real quick because our time is up. How does unrighteousness lead to treating others unjustly? Is anyone? Well, what I said, because God is righteous and holy, when we sow unrighteousness, it results, in other words, it reaps in injustice. It's whatever we plant, we reap. Amen. And that's the very essence of it. You can't reap, reap corn and get tomatoes. It, it, it doesn't happen. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, our time is up next week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, please read the uh, scriptures between. Next week we're on 14, 1 through 9. Please read the scriptures from 10 to 14 so you get the context of what's going on. Uh, the restoration promised. Uh, can I get Mrs. Allen to give us a short prayer? Short prayer. <laughs> Let us look to the Lord. Oh, gracious Master, we do indeed thank you for the beauty of this day and for the opportunity once again, Sovereign God, to come together to learn more about you and to just fellowship one with another is iron sharpened iron. Now, O oh Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit continue to dwell within us so that we are aware and break up any fallow soil within ourselves that would prevent us from going closer to you and becoming more like you. Be with us as we now depart one from another, never from thy presence. Give us traveling grace and mercy as we go to First Baptist Church of Suitland to hear more of your word that you will give to the one who is the head of your flock, O oh God. Be with us as we t return to our homes. This we are eternally grateful for, and we lift this prayer up. We uh, ask your blessings upon all who are online, O oh God. And uh, we lift this prayer up in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I, I